Interesting tidbits from probability theory by James Tanton, and this presentation is sponsored by the Innovative Teaching and Learning Committee of AMATIC. So if you are not familiar with AMATIC, we are the American Mathematical Association of two-year colleges with the core value of building expertise and exhibiting leadership in the teaching and learning of mathematics and enhancing personal growth and improving teaching methods and effectiveness as a personally initiated lifelong responsibility. So you can always find more information on our website. And the views expressed by the presenter, James Tanton, today are not necessarily the views of AMATIC. And I don't think James is going to mention any commercial products, but if he does, they are not endorsed by AMATIC. So now we're going to actually switch not to the presenter slides, but to James's screen. So let me request his screen share so you should be receiving it right now if you don't if you can give me a quick shout that would be great okay well i just said so i do see the loading so let's okay see great i do see it i see a loading right now and ditto i see that too my screen is being shared i guess desktop share Ooh. You vanished on me. Let's see if we can get you guys back. Okay, great. I just see the blink or black screen in your mouse. Oh, there we go. I can see your screen now with all of your icons. And here we go. Oh, fabulous. You well, might um... want to try to... Uh, you might want to try to go full screen if you can so that we don't see the chat in here twice. Oh, okay. So what if I see the chat? I wonder how that there works. we go. All right. I don't see the chat, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, um, well, hello, first well, of all. if anybody says... Okay, well then I shall just get started. So, um, it, well, for starters, it's good to e-meet all of you, you folk. Um, thanks for joining today. And this is Intriguing Tidbits and Probability Theory. So let me just start, which would have to be what I think is my favorite intriguing tidbit of all time from probability theory. And uh, here you hopefully see on the screen um, a very classic nursery rhyme, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Um, this actually has a very amazing property. This is a mathematically rich nursery rhyme, which not many people realize. And, you, you know, I might, I might start off my course and probably through my students this way. So it's just something to get them wondering and startled by what's really going on here. Um, but let's see, what, what is it that could be mathematically rich about this particular piece? Well, you know, kids will start counting letters and trying to find patterns this way and that. And it takes a while, but um, it's a little bit of a mystery here. So let me just give things away. Here's the mathematical feature of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Choose any word you like, anywhere in the first two lines. Maybe I'll choose the word little. And the game we're going to play is the following. Well, count me how many letters in the word little. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six letters in little. Let's count six words forward. One, two, three, four, five, six. That gets me on U. That has three letters in it. Now I'm going to count three letters, three words forward. One, two, three. And I'm on above. Five letters, I believe. One, two, three, four, five. Lands me on like. Four letters. One, two, three, four is V. V is three letters. Eins, zwei, drei. Gets me on twinkle, which is, uh, oh gosh, seven letters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I play on you. If I play the game with you now, I'm off the screen. So when I played this game starting on little, I got stuck on the word you. This feels kind of random. But let's play the game again. This time, let's start with the word, I don't know, wonder. Any word in the first two lines. And we'll chase our way through the rhyme again. One, two, six letters. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six places forward is the. The has three letters. Three places forward. One, two, three is high. Four letters, one, two, three, four gets me on in. In is two letters, sky, sky is three letters, one, two, three gets me on little, little is six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm stuck on you again. Now, you might want to just take a moment and choose another word uh, in anywhere in the first two lines. Pick one at random and chase through the game and see where you get stuck. And I'll just give a little moment, but I can't see the chat room, so I'll just assume you're doing this for the moment. 
So pick a word, count your way forward, and tell me, do you end up here? I'm just pausing while you do that. And hopefully that was just enough time to count your way through. And the amazing thing about Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, start on any word in the first two lines, you're guaranteed to end up on the word you. In fact, you can push this a little bit further. What if I start on the word up? That's two letters, one, two, that gets me to the, I've already landed on the, so I know that also goes to you. So up works. Above, five letters, one, two, three, four, five, that gets me on like. We've already done like, we know that goes to you as well. So above works, but this, this goes even further. So you can check that all the first four letter words work, the next uh, six words work, up it works, above works. What about the? One, two, three, lands on main high, feel like I've been there before, that also lands on you. It's amazing. I think, it actually breaks down for world. All right, so that's, that's, that's intriguing. You might think it's just a, just a little feature of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. But I have a piece of homework for you for tonight. And here comes the real intriguing tidbit of probability theory. Go to whichever novel you're reading, here's a page of text, and just open up to a random page. So you've got all these words on your page, whatever novel you're reading tonight. And I challenge you to play the following game. Do, 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 do. Choose any word somewhere in the first paragraph on that page of text. Choose a word, and then play this counting game. Count your way through the text, and you'll land at some word at the very near the bottom of the page, that if you went further, you'd go off the page. See where you get stuck. And then do it again. Pick another word somewhere in the first paragraph. Count your way through it, and I bet you will again land on the same word at the bottom of that page. If you don't believe me, actually do try it. And if you don't believe it on that page, you think it's just random, just, just by pure coincidence, Open up another page of a completely different book and chase your way through its characters, its words. You will land up on the same place at the end. So this freaks out students. This is a wonderful, wonderful, intriguing tidbit of probability theory that says, ask you what on earth is going on. Well, at the beginning of a course, can I remember, oh, at the beginning of a course, this is a bit much to handle, but what I'm really going to have to use here, um, it motivates the use of the word and in probability theory, what I mean by that. If you do a naive probability theory, very, very beginning things, you often say uh, the probability of A and B occurring, if they're independent events of all this, is given by multiplication. So how do I work my way through the mathematics of this twinkle twinkle little star paradox? Well, when, it, when you've got to the point of your probability theory course, we're comfortable doing this. Well, here's how the game works. Let's look at twinkle twinkle little star. We start with the word little. And as we chased our way through, we end up on obviously you and then above. So I'll circle all the words I landed on, like and the, and then twinkle, and that got me to you. So if I start on another word, like the first twinkle, perhaps, that's seven letters, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it gets me on what? One, two, three, four, and it's above. That's on a circled word. I know I'm going to end up back on the same path to the bottom. Or if I start on I, that's one word, uh, one letter long, excuse me, gets me onto wonder, wonder is six, one, two, three, four, five, six, these, one, two, three, hi, one, two, three, four, blah, blah, blah. I think I'll land on twinkle again. So the idea is, if you play this game once and circle all the words you land on, we know that if you ever land on a circled word again, you are destined to follow the same path and end up the same bottom spot. So what's the probability of this not working? Well, what you need to do is choose a word that's a different starting point and not land on a circled word and then not land on a circled word and then not land on a circled word not land on a circled word not land on a circled word and so on the thing about the english language all words are you know somewhere between typically two to i don't know nine letters long and maybe you can say you know you've got a sense of you know a path of say 20 letters oh, sorry uh, say 20 circled words in a page of text the chances of missing and missing and missing and missing and missing, if you're doing this, say, 30 times, you know, it might be some number like chance of missing is 9.7 or something. If you do that 30 times, the chance of always missing as you work your way down the text is basically going to zero. So actually, you could argue, what's the chance of you working your way through a text from a different starting point and missing all previously circled words? It's negligible. In other words, you're more or less guaranteed to land in the same spot at the bottom. Now, actually, I use the word guaranteed first on. It's not true. This is not guaranteed. This, this probability is not going to be actually zero, um, but it's been pretty darn close to it. And, and practically every uh, piece of text you pull out from the book will have this property going on. Uh, this phenomenon is actually is well known. It was actually discovered in the 1980s. That's my very scrawly handwriting, excuse me, uh, by Peter Kruskal, and it's called the Kruskal count. 
and you actually have a fun game with the kids and do this to playing cards. Uh, turn up all your cards up in a row, one great big long row of all face-up cards, and you know, pick any card in the first six of that row, and counting the numbers through, count all the way down the line, you know, move if the numbers are six, like diamonds, count six cards forward. If it's a queen, count it 12 cards forward. If you, and then the number 10, count 10 cards forward. Playing the card, this game with a deck of cards, you always, almost certainly, guaranteed to land on the same card back in the end. So there it is. Chris Schools Count is a wonderful way to start off a course to motivate what's going on. Unfortunately, it's not until you get further into the course that you start talking about the theory of basic probability about the word and being translated in some naive sense to multiplication. Actually, um, let me talk about that. How, how do I even, how do I explain why and and multiplication is the appropriate things to do? There's actually a nice, another intriguing tidbit in probability theory right there. So let's see. Uh, let me just clear my screen. And I'm at a strange disadvantage because I don't see the chat room. So I've got no sense of how things are going. So I'm talking to myself. So I trust all is fine thus far. All right, here goes. How do I explain and? Let's have some fun with this one. So in some sense, and corresponds to multiplying in a very naive sense. Well, here's a fun game. Imagine I had a garden path. Here's a path. And as you go down the path, you get to a fork. If you take the left fork, you end up in house A. If you take the right fork, you end up in house B. And suppose I send 100 people down this garden path. And when they come down the fork, let's assume they equally like to go left or right to house A or house B. So that means if I actually you know, represented these people as dots, I'll draw 100 dots, maybe I'll draw a square of dots, 10 by 10 array of dots to represent all 100 people. I'd expect if I was watch these people walk down the path, half of the folks would end up in house A, half the folks would end up in house B. So here's a nice model for representing a choices of events that could occur. Now, if I make the path a little more complicated, for example, suppose I come down a garden path and maybe right away it splits into three and the people that go on the left path end up straight in house A. But the people going to the middle path might split again. Maybe half of those go into house, house A and another half go into house B. And maybe the folks on the right end, maybe they split into three. The left of those folks go to A, the middle of those folks go to uh, B and the remaining sets go to the third house C. Can I get a sense of what's happening, about how many people end up in, what portion of people end up in each house? Well, yeah, I can do the same idea. So let me represent this, uh, the people as a sort of an array of dots in a square, and I won't even bother drawing this, the square, or the dots, I'll just draw the square. I like this third, first choice means a third of the people go left, straight, and to the right. So I can represent those three options this way. Of those that go left, those folks end up straight in house A. But the folks that go down the middle path split to two like this. And those who go to the left end up in A, those who go straight to the right end up in B. So I can represent it this way, A, B. And uh, of the people on the, uh, the right, they split to thirds, each going into house A, B, or C, which means I can draw a picture like this. This portion of the people on the right go to A, this portion go to uh, house B, this portion go to house C. Now what's going on here? I can see that a third of the people went straight to house A, half of a third of the people, one-sixth, went to A, and one sixth went to B, and a third of the third of the people went to A. One ninth, a third of the third people went to B, a third of the third people went to C. So actually, I can see right now that the proportion of people that went to A is one third plus one sixth plus one ninth. The proportion of people that went to B is one sixth plus one ninth, and the proportion of folks that went to C is one ninth. And I could actually work out these fractions if I could do arithmetic in a hurry, which I can't. All right, but then there's a nice model to get a sense of proportions. Now, how do I link this up to probability theory? Well, uh, suppose I did something with, a, say, flip a coin. I'm going to flip a coin, and I'm going to roll a die. And what I'd love to get is a head here, and I'd like to get a five or a six on the die. So how can I get a sense of how to compute that probability? In some sense, I'm going to use the, the law of large numbers, if you like, that I'm going to represent as sending a whole bunch of people down a garden path, where the first thing happens is I flip the coin. So you can either get a tail or heads if you flip that coin. If you get a tail, you go straight to my don't want house. Whoops. Don't want. Whereas if you get a heads, I'm going to have you go um, on to a, the next option, which is rolling that die. Well, let's see. If you roll a die, there's actually six options. It is rolling a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5, or a 6. If you get a 5 or a 6, you're going into my want house. But if you get a 1, 2, 3, or 4, you're going to my don't want house. Okay, kind of having fun. So there is, there's a nice model. 
um, let me do this as an area model of a square. What's going on here? First of all, folks split into tails and heads. There's the don't want and the want part. Actually, I won't bother writing tails and heads just right now. Uh, and then, get my pen back. Of the people that end up on the heads half, they split into sixths, of which only two of those six do the want part. So I can see that I've actually got proportions of areas. What I've really got is one, th or two six, I should say, of half the area is the proportion of people that end up in the in the in the want house. One six in this case. That is, the probability of getting a heads and a five or a six really correspond to a fraction of a fraction of the area. Correspond to half five. Oh, sorry, oops, two six. Can't do counting right now. So you can actually use this area model, as I'm going through quickly here, uh, to motivate that geometrically and is corresponding to fractions of fractions or multiplications of fractions. And you can set things up this way. In fact, it's fun with kids to, uh, I shouldn't call them kids, so to, to with students of all ages uh, to, to play with you know, complicated ones. For example, what's the garden path model of rolling a coin, oops, sorry, tossing a coin, getting a heads, tossing another coin, getting another heads, and roll, whoops, rolling a die and getting, I don't know, a six. Well, the garden path model will give heads, tails, send them straight to the don't want. Uh, of the heads people, that could be heads, tails, send them straight to the don't want. And then of the, of the uh, uh, rolling the dice people, five, six of these folks, it's a huge band, five of the six folks go to the don't want, and the one, six goes to the, um, to the want pile. And you can draw the model there and explain that actually what fraction of the squared you have is going to be one half of one half of one sixth. All right. Maybe that's intriguing. Maybe that's not intriguing. Since this is a, a, a webinar on intriguing tidbits from probability theory, let me do something intriguing. So obviously, we all like to be mathematicians and want to encourage our students to think mathematically too. So let's just have some fun with this idea. Suppose I send some people down a garden path again, and it splits. People that go to the left go to house A, people that go to the right go to house B, and there's a middle folk. Some people might go straight ahead. Of those folks that go to straight ahead, some of them will go to house A, a third of them will go to house B, and a third of them will continue going straight ahead. Uh, of those that go straight ahead, let's split them into three again, house A, B, and keep going straight ahead. And in fact, I'll just do this on an infinitely long set of garden paths that forks forever. Keep doing this. All right. Crazy. An infinite picture of garden path. So what's the what's the actual picture look like? All right, so what's going to happen here? First of all, a third of the people go straight to house A. I'll color them in red. A third of the people go straight ahead, and we'll make house B blue. Let's make this very pretty. Now, of the people that went straight ahead, a third of those split into going to house A. A third of those went to house B. And of the third that went straight ahead, they split into thirds again. A third of those went to house A. Forgive me for being slow here, but I'm actually going to draw the picture. A third went to house B. And of those that went straight ahead, they split again. And developing this lovely spiral picture, which has some great mathematical interpretations. Namely, you see what I'm doing here, a third of a third of a third of a third, and so on. And what's going to fill in, whoops, my picture's getting very messy. You get a spiral shape. In fact, if you look at the blue, you can see that's matched exactly in area with the red. So the blue is taking up half the area of the square, and the red is taking up the other half of the square. If I could, if I could be godlike and go infinitely long doing this process. Well, what is the area of the red? Well, first of all, it was a third. Plus this section was a third of a third, a ninth. Plus this section, a third of a third of a third, so three sections is a 27th, plus the next, next section, a third of a third of a third of a third, and so on. Doing this forever, and we've just proven basically the geometric series formula for the value x equals one third. The sum of the powers of one third, if you do that forever, must be one half. So there's a lovely way to actually sneak in the geometric series formula into probability theory by playing with garden path. In fact, what's a lovely challenge now is what garden path picture will come up with a formula for the powers of a quarter? 
which equals one third. So there's a nice mystery to play with. All right. Uh, actually, this 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 reminds me. Since I've I've talked about naive probability theory, let me let me just really get to something that really does intrigue me. If you actually think deeply, so let me just go back to first principles for a little while. What do we even mean by probability in the first place? So so let's start at the beginnings, very beginnings. So what we very much we we'll usually start with some sort of sample space like this. We've got some sort of experiment, some sort of act, action, some activity going on of all possible outcomes of an event or of, of a, an activity, and maybe it's rolling a die. In which case we say the sample space, you know, the fancy jargon, is in this case all possible outcomes of rolling a die: one, two, three, four, five, or six. And we might be interested in some particular set of outcomes, like we call it an event, which is a subset of the sample space. Maybe the event I'm interested in is rolling an even: two, four, six. Now, given the setup, we define the probability of the event E occurring is really the size of the, of the event space over the size of the um, sample space. Now, the probability of rolling an even would be, well, there's three options out of a total of six options is one half. Okay, that's sort of our basic definition of what probability is in a very gentle, naive way. But I have to add one little caveat. This is assuming that each of the outcomes, each of the individual outcomes is equally likely. That is, that these are balanced in some sense. And what worries me about that is I've just used the term equally likely in defining probability. Probability is the size of the event space you're interested in compared to the size of the sample space in total, under the assumption all events are equally likely. That seems a tad circular to me. Um, and also pedagogically for students, this can be very confusing. What does equally likely, likely mean? Uh, let me go back to, you know, the dice rolling examples. Excuse me. Suppose I rolled two die, and I was interested in the sum that appears in rolling two die, and I have a great troubles with, with with my students, my participants in my courses over this issue. Well, what's the sample space? Well, obviously the sample space is all possible sums one could obtain, four, five, up to eleven, up to twelve, and well. And, you know, I might be interested in what's the probability of getting an even sum. I'll just, you know, count them up. But the trouble is, somehow we're meant to know these events are not equally likely. So a priori, somehow my students and I are meant to know when a sample space is composed of equally likely events or not. Now, of course, we're going to argue from experience. We roll a pair of die. What's really the equally likely events underneath are the pairs of numbers one obtains. Maybe it's a two and a four, and then you might roll a one and a three. So somehow you meant to know beforehand that the equally likely structure underneath this sample space are pairs of numbers. But even that's a bit confusing. Well, rolling a one and a three is the same as a three and a one. Lots of deep questions here. So when students struggle with this issue, what, what is a, what's my sample space really? What's my event really? How do I know things are equally likely? Is really a perturbing, perturbing um, issue here. The one trouble is, the way I help my students out with this is, actually think of the physical action you're doing when you're rolling die. You're, you're not actually, the, the, the way to get these sums is, well, you actually roll a pair of die. And one thing that I found greatly troublesome is this idea of doing things simultaneously. I say, don't. Simultaneity is a real problem in probability theory. It, nothing needs to be simultaneous. The question is a philosophical one. If I roll a pair of dice at the same time, is that philosophically equivalent to me rolling one die and then rolling a second one? You know, separate time events. And the answer is that is yes. In which case, if I view those two events as uh, uh, philosophically the same, let's talk about a first die and a second die. Whoops, second die. Whoops, there we go. In which case, it's very clear this order matter is, is important. One, three is a different uh, outcome from three, one. That helps students right there. Um, in fact, any event, in fact, in my entire probability course, will never do things simultaneously. If someone presents me a problem that's dealt with simultaneously, we ask, could I philosophically done it just uh, one type event after another? The answer is usually always yes, in which case matters become much clearer. But this worry about sample space and equally likely is fundamentally perturbing when things get kind of serious, the awkward about more complicated examples. For example, here's a classic conundrum from probability theory called Bertrand's paradox. It goes as follows. 
uh, here's a circle. And in it, I shall inscribe an equilateral triangle. And all that Bertrand asked was, if I picked a chord at random, what's the probability that the chord I choose, maybe it's something like that, or maybe it's something like this, just something at random, who knows what these chords are, ends up being longer than the side length of that equilateral triangle. You know, sometimes it will happen, maybe that red one looks longer, this little purple one down the bottom is certainly not longer. So what's the probability of the chord chosen at random is longer than the side length of the equilateral triangle? And I'll actually ask that question. Here comes the answer. And I'll be a little intriguing and say answer one. Well, if I'm doing a chords like this, I might as well just, you know, assume my pictures were a so that the, whatever the chord I've chosen, whoops, ooh, my pen's being crazy, excuse me. Let's get rid of that. Whatever chord I'm choosing, I might as well rotate my picture so I can assume its left end point is at the left leftmost point of the circle. So basically we'll just rotate the picture so we can assume our chord starts at the leftmost end point of the circle. In which case, just to orient myself, let's, let's draw the equilateral triangle. I did this way as well. Sorry, my picture is not very good here. So it's now clear under this setup that the chord I choose at random will be longer than the side of the triangle whenever the other end point lands in this region of the circle. And it will certainly be shorter if the second endpoint lands anywhere in this part of the circle or this part of the circle. Well, clearly, the region I'm interested in is one third of the perimeter of the circle. So the answer to this particular Bertrand's question is what's the probability of choosing a chord longer than the side length of an equilateral triangle? Clearly and absolutely, the answer is one third. And that is absolutely valid and absolutely correct answer. Here comes answer number two. Whoops. Pen, answer number two. Well, if I'm going to play this game, I might as well assume that uh, I've rotated the picture, so whatever chord I've chosen is rotated to be horizontal. You know, it's like this, like this, like this. Is it just, you know, once you've got your chord, just flip, flip it around and make it horizontal. And let me just draw my equilateral triangle this way. And in fact, I'll even just make it a star shape here. Let's draw a second one this way. Now, when I do this, it's clear that the midpoint of these horizontal chords are kind of key. If I give you the midpoint first, I know where the chord is. And it becomes a little exercise in geometry now that you can see that the midpoint lands anywhere in this section of the diagram. You know, if it lands here, it'll be between these two uh, the dotted lines, oops, be between these two dotted lines the size of the triangle. I'll clearly get a longer chord. And if the midpoint lands anywhere in this section or this section, I get a chord that's shorter than the side length of the triangle. Exercise in the geometry, it turns out this purple section is one half the length of the diameter. Not too bad, you can actually kind of see it, but actually as you start drawing lots of equilateral triangles everywhere, it all works out. So that means the probability of the chord you choose being longer is actually one half. That answer is absolutely valid and absolutely correct, and there's nothing mathematically wrong with that answer. Here comes answer number three. Now we're intrigued. Let's just clear my board. Answer number three in scrawly handwriting. Here it comes. Answer toi. All right. This time, if I just have a chord chosen at random, I can identify its midpoint. Its midpoint's going to be somewhere. And the amazing thing is, if I give you the midpoint first, it's clear where the chord has to be. So in fact, every chord you draw is completely determined by its midpoint. There's one exceptional case, namely if I happen to, the midpoint happens to be right at the center of the circle, in which case there's only many chords, but the chance of you picking the exact center of the circle, zero. All right, so all I need to do is focus on where the midpoints need to be. All right, so let me again draw my, whoops, equilateral triangle. And a little thought shows that if I draw the in circle to the equilateral triangle, whenever the midpoint is inside that in circle, I will get a line that's longer than the core, or the side of the triangle. So the question is, what's the chance of me choosing a midpoint at random landing in this smaller circle here? Well, again, it's an exercise in geometry. In fact, you can check that this radius of the circle is, is um, half the radius of the big circle. It's actually by a scale factor of half. This area is one quarter of the area of the whole circle. So the probability of you choosing a core that's longer than the side of the one triangle, the equilateral triangle, is actually one quarter. Each of these answers is mathematically valid. 
So basically, we've just proven that one third equals one half equals one quarter. This is the trouble with probability theory. This is very intriguing. This actually caused a bit of woe, and it made people realize that there's some fundamental problems with the definitions, the very defin definitions at the beginning of the theory. So like I was perturbed about the fact that two dice um, having a sample space, which wasn't equally likely, and somehow we meant to know what equally likely means to begin with, is really coming to the fore here. The trouble is with this paradox and the way Bertrand resolved it was said, can we define what at random means? Pick a chord at random. The issue there is at random isn't defined. If you defined at random, literally in the first case, to fix a point on the circle and choose a second endpoint of a diamond of a, of a chord, um, that's fine. You will definitely come up with the answer one third. That's absolutely valid. If you decide that at random means to draw the circle on the ground, stand at one end of the room and roll a broomstick always horizontally across the room until it stops somewhere across the circle and check if that, that broomstick lands at a position longer than the side length of the, of the, uh, longer than the, side length of the triangle, <sighs> sorry, um, then by horizontal chords, this is an absolutely valid way of choosing chords. So if you're doing the rolling a broomstick across the room method to choosing randomness, you'll find that about half the time your broomstick handles will be longer than the chord of the side of the triangle. Or if your randomness is by uh, choosing midpoints at random, some uniform distribution of area, I guess, then actually this is valid. In fact, then it's a very nice exercise, it's very messy, and it's actually very hard to measure. But it's worth trying one time and just see what mess comes of it. Actually draw a circle on the ground and get a whole bunch of spaghetti and just drop it from above. That's the equivalent of picking a midpoint at random. So if you actually were to drop spaghetti across a circle from above, just throw it up in the air and let it land, count the proportion of those that land in such a way that the, the chords they define, if they actually land on the circle, that's half, another half of the problem, is long on the side of the triangle, you found about a quarter of them will work. So Bertrand pointed out that we need to define what at random means first in a probability problem. That is, in advanced language, we need to define what prob measure, probability measure we're going to use first before we analyze a problem. So in some sense, it's kind of cheating. Uh, probability theory is based on defining which probability measure you're going to use first and then studying the theory. Of course, in a first course of probability theory, we don't do that. We just somehow assume that at equally likely makes pure sense that students can handle this, handle this just fine. But actually, it's very intriguing. The two dice, the three dice, four dice problem are very, very much problematic in that. All right, so, so there's, you know, depending on one's audience, I've, I've certainly shown Bertrand's paradox with students in the beginning course. Um, if I felt that they were ready for this and could handle it and enjoy it, and, it, and they do often, uh, but that's not always the case. Sometimes I choose not to do this with students. But um, even if you choose not to do it, there's a lot of intrigue and fun nonetheless, even if you decide not to get into any philosophical concerns or woes. So, for example... Let's go back and assume we understand everything about probability theory just fine, that everything is cool, that there's no philosophical troubles. We can still have some fun. Here's another intriguing tidbit, my next intriguing tidbit for the day. Uh, magic squares. Lots of people like playing with magic squares. And here's a classic 3 by 3 magic squares. Three, okay. Uh, so it has nine cells, and the classic magic squares have the numbers 1 through the number of cells. So here's 1, 2, 3... Four, five, six, uh, am I doing this correctly? Seven, eight, nine. Hopefully every row adds up to 15. Looks right. Looks every column adds up to 15. Looks like I'm doing it correctly. And plus the two diagonals add up to 15. Yay, there's a magic square. All right. So three people are going to play the following game. Albert will choose a number at random from the first row. Bilbert will choose a number at random from the second row. And Cuthbert will choose a number at random from the, second, from the third row. So I'm about to show you another magic property of a magic square that not many people know about. And I'm going to ask, what's the probability that A chooses a higher number than B? What's the probability that Albert beats Bilbert by choosing a number at random? So let's actually work this out. So what I'm going to do is list all the possibilities. So here's all the options Albert could have chosen. He could choose a 6, a 1, or an 8. And Bilbert could choose either a 7, a 5, or a 3. And in this case, if Bilbert chose a 7 and Albert chooses a 6, Bilbert wins. In fact, whenever Bilbert chooses a 7, he's going to, whoops, over here, Albert could choose an 8. Whoops, it's bad at me. Okay. Well, actually, the thing, if Albert chooses an 8, excuse me, he's guaranteed to win. So the whole beat in those three cases. All right. Uh, let's see. If, oh, if Albert ever chooses a 1, he's, he's sure enough to lose to Bilbert. And let's see, the 6th case, here Albert wins, here Albert wins. 
So we see that Albert wins five out of nine times. So the probability of Albert beating Bilbert is five ninths. All right, let me ask what's the probability of Bilbert beating Cuthbert? Let's do the same work. Probability of Bilbert beating Cuthbert. Bilbert could choose a 7, a 5, or a 3. Cuthbert could choose a 2, a 9, or a 4. Cuthbert and Bilbert. If Bil Cuthbert ever chooses the 9, he's guaranteed to win. So he should choose the 9, but let's assume he chooses one at random, like I said at the beginning. If he chooses the 2, he's guaranteed to lose to Bilbert. And if he chooses a 4, he'll lose here, he'll lose here, and win here. So look, see, what's the chances of Bilbert beating Cuthbert? Well, Bilbert beats Cuthbert five times out of nine. And you probably guess where I'm going with this. If you check Cuthbert versus Albert, you'll find that Cuthbert beats Albert five ninths of the time. All right, so here's a wonderful feature of probability theory. We've just proven that in some sense, Albert always beats Bilbert, and Bilbert, you know, is, sorry, is more likely to beat Bilbert Bilbert's more likely to beat Cuthbert, and Cuthbert's more likely to beat Albert. In some sense, we've got non-transitivity going on. This really freaks out a lot of people. You know, if I said Agatha is taller than Petrina, and Petrina's taller than, than Charlena, then clearly Agatha's meant to be called, uh, taller than Charlena. But you can't have this last one going on. It's a wonderful thing about probability theory that, you know, non-transitivity can go on. It's, it's good to point this out with students. In fact, let me just give you the classic example. Oh, 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 before I do that, that was the three by three magic square. So here's my piece of homework for you. Look on the internet for the four by four magic square using numbers one through 16. There are four rows, so there'll be a, a Dilbert playing this game as well. In that four by four square, look at the probability of Albert beating Bilbert, Bilbert beating Cuthbert, Cuthbert beating Dilbert, and then Dilbert beating Albert. Does the four by four magic square, that is several of them, have this property as well? And if you're intrigued, go into the 5x5 five five and see what happens. So a little known property of magic squares, it seems. Anyhow, back to non-transitivity, which is a wonderful delight. I should point out the classic example of the non-transitive dice. So normally a die is made of the numbers 1 through 6. But suppose I gave you die A, I'll just draw a little net for it, which is labeled Four, four, four. Well, it's got four fours and two zeros. A very strange dice. And here's die number B. Here's a, let me draw a net for it. Whenever you roll a die B, you're guaranteed to get a three. All the numbers are three. Here's die C. Um, it has uh, several twos, two, 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 and two sixes. And there's a fourth die, die D. Let me draw its net. And it's given by 5, 5, 5, 5, 1, and 1. All right, a little exercise here. You can work out that A beats B two-thirds of the time. Bet you can see that right now. And that B beats C two-thirds of the time. Bet you can see that right now. That D beats, uh, sorry, C beats D. You have to think about it, but that beats, C beats D two-thirds of the time. And you can guess what's going to happen now. D actually beats A two-thirds of the time. So there is four non-transitive dice. Okay, fun little puzzle for, for students. Four, that seems like a lot. Can you create an example of three non-transitive dice? I mean, obviously you did it with three, I guess you could do it with the, the magic square, just double up all those numbers, but can we come up with other, another triple of, of non-transitive dice and just keep them as three dice? What about two dice? Is it even possible for two dice to be non-transitive? Could A beat B and then B beat A? Hmm. Well, that's a little quickie. All right. In fact, while we're at it, at intriguing dice, I'm just going to go on and give you all the tidbits I can think of that are intriguing in, in the probability course. There's a wonderful fellow, an army fellow by the name of Colonel George Zicherman. And several decades, decades ago, he must have just been playing. He was looking at dice again, and... Looking at all the sums you get if you roll a pair of dice. And obviously, I can oops, draw a table of all the possible sums. If I roll one dice, I get one, two, three, four, five, or six. If I roll a second die, I get one, two, three, four, five, or six. I would never personally roll them simultaneously, at least not in my mind. And look at all the possible sums you get. You get two, three, four, five, six, seven, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is a very boring webinar. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Oh, oops, oops. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's all the possible sums, which is great because now I can work out the probability of rolling a seven, for example. I guess it's one, two, three, four, five, six out of thirty-six. And the probability of rolling a five is I can just count this four fives, four out of thirty-six in this curly handwriting. But Zickerman was wondering. Is it possible to have a different numbering on these dice, rather than the standard numberings I'm showing here, such that uh, the probability of rolling any particular sum is still the same? Well, Clever Zickerman found such a pair. And let me show you how, what he came up with. He said if you number one die, for the, give, the number, give one die the numberings 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 4, and the second die the numberings 1, 3, 4, five, six, and eight. And look at all the possible sums you get when looking at these guys. And I'm going to be a little bit boring and do it. If you roll a one and a one, you get a sum of two. A one and two gives you a three, a three, a four, a four, and a five. Uh, a four, a five, five, six, six, and a seven. Ooh, what's this? Five, six, six, seven, seven, eight. Uh, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, and nine. Seven, eight, eight, nine, nine, and 10, and 9, 10, 10, 11, 11, and 12. So he's got these renumbered dice. And let's ask, what's the probability of rolling a 7 with Zickerman dice? Well, we see that the sum of 7 occurs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times out of 36. 6 out of 36, just like before. Well, the probability of rolling a, a 5 with Zickerman dice. Where are the 5s? Uh, there's 1, 2, 3, 4. 4 is 4 out of 36, just like before. That the probability of rolling a 2 is 1 out of 36, just like before. Probably rolling a 3 is 2 out of 36, just like before. And so on. Probably rolling 11 is 2 out of 36. Probably rolling an 8 is, or was it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The same. So these Zickerman dice give exactly the same probabilities as a pair of ordinary dice. So I've always wondered with Zickerman dice, what would it be like to play a game with them like Monopoly? If you play Monopoly with Zickerman dice, surely the game should be exactly the same. I'll usually pause there. There's actually going to be one difference. Yes, the, so the moves you can make will be fine. They'll be back the same distribution as before, except with Monopoly, doubles matter, because if you get doubles in Monopoly, uh, you get to roll again. So my question is, how true are uh, Zickerman dice for a game of Monopoly? What does that mean? Will you roll doubles with just as much frequency as before? And what type of doubles will you roll? So there's a fundable analysis question. If you want a really tough question, and I'll give the answer away on this one, and it still takes some doing, prove that if you want to stick with positive whole numbers, these are the only pairs of renumberings for ordinary die. That the Zickerman die in the realm of positive counting numbers is, are essentially unique. Can you prove that? That's hard. That's very hard. In fact, in fact, why stick at die? that are cubes. Here's a pair, here's an ordinary tetrahedral die. It has four triangular faces and it's numbered one, two, three, four. And here's a second one. Numbered one, two, three, four. And when you roll these things, what you do is you look at the number that's actually bottom to the ground. You know, if this whatever number is on the bottom is, is what you consider the roll to be. Alright, so certainly it has its own, I won't go to the table, possible set of sums. Do, 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 do. Can you come up with a pair of your Zickerman tetrahedral die? Can you come up with a renumbering that has the same sum probability distribution as the ordinary tetrahedral die? Does it work? And is your answer unique if you can find it? And then, you know, of course, there's a myriad of questions here. What about triples of die? What if I had three ordinary cubical die or three ordinary, ordinary um, tetrahedral die? Can I replace them with a Zickerman version of these things? Loads of fun, lots of intriguing tidbits, a lot of hard work actually sometimes. All right, so let me give me one little more tidbit. When you're actually playing the basic naive game of probability theory where and equals times and or equals plus, and uh, that's assuming everything's nice and independent, imagine John is about to play the following game. He has a bag, and in this bag is a red ball, a white ball, and a blue ball. This is bag number one. So the idea is you pull out a ball at random. If the ball turns out to be red, he wins. Turns out to be blue, 
he loses, which turns out to be white, he goes to bag number two. And in this bag number two, there turns out to be two red balls, a white ball and two blue balls. And he'll pick out a ball. If it turns out to be red, he wins. If it turns out to be blue, he loses. If it turns out to be white, he goes to bag number three. And in bag number three, there are three red balls, a white ball and three blue balls. And here we go again. If he picks out, happens to pick out a red one, he wins. If he picks a blue one, he loses. And if he picks out a white one, he goes to bag number four. And there you can see what I'm doing here. So this is very handy. There happens to be an infinite number of bags going on for him to play this game with. All right, so my question simply is, what's the probability of John winning this game? All right. Ugh. So here's the complicated way to answer it. The probability of a win is either pick a red ball right away or pick a white ball and go to bag number two and then win there or pick a white ball, a white ball and then pick a red ball and bag number three or and so on. Okay, that's fine. How am I going to make this happen? Well, in naive probability, uh, or translate to philosophers will say, pick a red ball right away, you've got a one third chance of doing that. Or pick a white ball one third chance of doing that in bag number one, and then choose a red ball from bag number two. That's actually, there's a two fifths chance of doing that. Or pick a white ball, one and third chance. In bag number two, pick a white ball again, one and five chance. Then pick a red ball, three out of um, seven. Or pick a white ball, pick a white ball, pick a white ball, and then pick a red ball, three out of nine, and so on. So there's the answer to the probability question. It's some horrible infinite sum. Great. That was the hard way to answer it. Philosophically, what's the easy way to answer this? Well, this game is so symmetrical in red and blue. In fact, every bag has an equal number of red and blue balls. So at you know, any stage, there's no difference between picking a red and a blue. The only question is, could he keep choosing a white ball forever and ever and ever? Well, the answer is actually no, because the chance of choosing a white ball forever is going to be one third times one fifth, then choose white again, one seventh times choose, choose a white again, one ninth, one eleventh, so on. That clearly goes to zero. He won't be picking a, a white ball forever. He will eventually choose a colored ball. And since it's symmetrical in red and blue, the answer has to be equally likely for each, in which case the chance of him winning is a half. So we've just proven a crazy formula from Calculus 2, if you like. That apparently a third plus a third times two fifths plus a third times a fifth times three sevenths. In fact, basically I've got like a factorial of the odd numbers on the bottom, and I've got, you know, I thought I had to write this n and odd this standard notation odd-ish factorial. The sum of these guys, very, very loose, is one half. In fact, you can have lots of fun with this. Change the distribution of balls. Um, you know, if you keep it symmetric, you can tell what the answer is. If you keep it slightly asymmetrical, that can always make it clear that the ch chance of choosing a red ball is one third in the entire game. You can come up with other infinite series. And you can actually have lots of fun with this and, and create all sorts of crazy things that will be very difficult to prove by standard techniques and calculus. But you can actually evaluate some crazy infinite sums. The key is you've got to just make sure that the chance of being stuck in an infinite loop goes to zero. And then you can prove these series if you're of the analysis mind really do converge. All right, so let me um, just stop there. I see that it's, it's about six minutes to go before the hour is up. I've just prattled on. I've got no sense of anything about what I'm saying that's been helpful or not. Let me just uh, so if, yes, uh, well, sorry to interrupt, but if anyone any has a question for James, I think now would be a good time to enter it since he had the chat okay. window open. So maybe you want to open that back up, James so that if anyone wants to ask a question, you'll be able to see it. It looked like you were typing, Wendy, but I'm not sure if you still are. <laughs> oh, well, I can't. I hurt myself, so I don't. So I don't think I want to adjust my my volume again. I see that John has made the comment. 
Okay, well... Let's see if... Let's see well, what Richard is going to say. Yeah. And then if um, there's not too many more questions, I can actually uh, let people know real quick, quickly where the recording will be available and the information about the uh, survey here. Okay, so let me switch over to the slides again real quickly. And let's thank you, see. Wendy. So just as another comment, thanks again for participating in today's AMATIC webinar. And if you would like to support our future webinars, please consider becoming a member of AMATIC at the link on the screen. And remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash amatic. And just remember that a recording of today's and all of the past amatic webinars can be found at the bit.ly slash amatic webinars. And it will take us one to two weeks to produce and upload the webinars to this archive. But I honestly do think that it will be closer to one to two days though we'll be as quick as we can about this and if you could please take two minutes to evaluate today's webinar on the content and the presenter James that would be greatly appreciated at bit.ly slash amatic 103 so if you need a confirmation of your participation today then just please fill out your email address and name that you want the confirmation sent to in the optional section of the evaluation and I think that Richard had his hand raised at one point so if you still have a question Richard feel free to uh, enter it in the chat room but thanks again for attending everyone and if you could please take the survey at the link on the screen, that would be greatly appreciated. And again, you will be receiving a link from me to the recording once it is uploaded and produced. So if you don't have any questions, uh, if you could please thank the speaker, James, again in the chat, that would be great. And thanks again for attending today's webinar. Thank you all. This is fun. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> Anaheim. Never been to Anaheim. Can I get to go to Disneyland? Thanks, Heather. Yes, um, email you me. Might I do, want I do to, often go out to California. Uh, type so your you email account, address so. in the um, chat box, James, yeah, the, if the, you don't mind, chat, so who, that who Richard will have it. I'm glad that Socrates is typing since I'm still not sure who you are. <laughs> so, yes, if, if you could let me know, that would definitely be great. <laughs> right. Thanks, Socrates. Thank you for, thanks, Richard. Oh, Yen Kang, thank you too. Just missed yours. Yes, lots of videos. You'll be there for hours. Watch out. <laughs> Uh, 
I uh, yes, Richard. And, and from my experience, I would say for someone who hasn't watched James's videos before, try watching maybe the quadratic formula one first. <laughs> I really like that one in particular. But maybe James can give us one of his favorites that he's made. Oh gosh, heavens. Um, you know, I'm actually very pleased with the quadratics one. I agree. I, 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 like, um, I like the natural way to graph quadratics. Um, so look, look, look at the section. You go under Think Curriculum on my website the tab that says Think Curriculum, and just look at the ones on graphing quadratics. We make it so complicated for students. Here's, there's a more natural and easy way to do it. So I'm very proud of that, that particular video. And then, of course, the quadratic formula, how to avoid it. Yes, I, I agree. One. Just poke around. You'll find lots of good stuff. At least I think it's good. I shouldn't be so... So, so bold there. <laughs> well, and I also agree with Richard that maybe after finals are over is the best time. I think I have about two and a half more weeks. I don't know how long into December everyone else goes. <laughs> oh, so... Um this year, I'm a visiting scholar at the Mathematical Association of America, so I've just moved to Washington, D.C. Um, I spent the last 10 years of my life uh, actually up in Boston in, in a boarding school, working with high school students. Uh, but I also um, do a lot of outreach work with uh, teachers and, um, and I guess the college crowd as well. So I started a, a math institute up in Boston that worked with kids, getting them involved in math research and just you know really engaged in good math, having fun with math. And I worked with teachers, and I and I um, did a lot of professional development for teachers, and I did whatever outreach I could just to promote good, joyful thinking in mathematics, just make it less cluttered and just 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 really very real, and you know the joy that we experience as mathematicians over this. Let's share that with the world. But now I'm in D.C., so now I'm doing that same sort of outreach work um, with the MAA, and it's a it's a lot of fun actually. Well, I think that <laughs> although Richard is still typing, I'm actually going to end the official recording at this time.